infection. And that's basic hygiene principles. Wash your hands, make sure that you stay at a di respectable distance from a person who you feel might be sick, and make sure that they're able to call into the number that's required here in the UK, that's been given out in the UK, to report that they might have infection. So okay. people being empowered to deal with their own uh, health is what's most important, and at the same time, an understanding that we're all in this together and that we have to protect others if we can, so that if we ourselves become sick, we make sure we protect our families and others by staying at a distance from them and making sure that we notify the health authorities. Okay, one, one last bit on, on the pandemic question and how worried should we be if it's suddenly called a pandemic. I'm thinking about the H1N1 flu pandemic in 2009. Um, the death rate was less severe than we see in normal flu. And it stuck around, but nobody seems to be too panicked or worried about H1N1. It's still with us. It's past the pandemic. Um, is, is it just a word, a uh, pandemic? Does it mean that if it's gone pandemic, that it's here with us to stay and it becomes one of those normal human coronaviruses like the other four that cause common cold? Yeah. The, the word pandemic might not really be appropriate in the 21st century. You know, this is a word that's been used in the past to describe when waves of cholera came through the world from the many times from Asia into the rest of the world, and when the plague came into Europe and other places. These were called pandemics, and, and they, were, they have a historical place. Today we're in a world that's entirely different. Countries don't wait to be told there's a certain pandemic or whatever. They do their risk assessments daily with information that's available on the internet, that's available throughout the world instantaneously. And so it's really now a matter of countries doing their own risk assessment based on what the World Health Organization and others tell these countries that they can give the information that they give, and at the same time to model their response based on good epidemiological principles, outbreak containment, and widespread mitigation if necessary. Okay. Um, we've heard a lot about the lessons that have been learned from SARS and other outbreaks that have been brought in that we see at work here. Can you tell me a bit about the lessons that we learned from other outbreaks that are not being applied here? Well, you know, what's good about this outbreak, if there's anything good, is that this outbreak has even gone a step further than the collaboration that's been done in the past, for example, with the SARS outbreak. After the SARS outbreak, there was much concern, for, for example, that academics withheld data, did not publish that data until they were ready to publish it and could get the credits they needed in academia. <coughs> Today, all the major medical journals are providing rapid peer review, online access, open access uh, in front of the paywall for any articles that are being, being proposed and accepted. So everybody has the access at no cost to the current medical literature on this current outbreak. That did not occur in the SARS outbreak. It was started, but the medical journals have gotten together and decided, yes, that they will do that. At the same time, after the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa, there was a group here called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which is an organization which is based here in London and also in, in uh, Oslo, and which is attempting to develop vaccine platforms for vaccines that might be caught, for disease that might be caused by emerging viruses. This CEPI has invested some in development of vaccines for coronaviruses. At present is investing either more, even more and that funding will remain available even if this outbreak stops, is declared over, and the funding dries up in the private sector. This public-private partnership will continue to fund research. And that's been a major problem, drying up of funds after outbreaks have occurred. Okay, but um, going back to the question, which yeah. was what is not being applied, lessons that we should have learned. Well, For instance, I mean, one I was thinking about is, have we really applied anything we've learned about the way we interact with wildlife? For instance, the, this culture of wet markets, mm -hmm. um, where live and dead animals, including wildlife, yeah. mingle and are sold for food. I mean, that seemed to have been an important lesson from SARS, but it seems to be a difficult 
issue to tackle. I mean, yeah, yeah and I think you've really hit the, the nail on the head because what happened during the SARS outbreak was that there was a lot of research going on to determine whether or not coronaviruses were being spread in live animal markets in China. Funding was available, uh, antibody evidence of infection of less severe coronaviruses were found to be greater in workers in live animal markets than in the general population. And at the end of the research, at the end of the outbreak, when it was declared over, the research funding dried up. And so we weren't able to see a continuation of that research, which could have provided understanding of how to prevent these infections at the source instead of having to, having to jump on them with costly outbreak response mechanisms. So yes, there were lessons learned that weren't followed. Okay, and on, on just zeroing in on the wet markets, wet markets are coming under a lot of, um, should we say, blame or suspicion. Mm -hmm. are, are you convinced that wet markets must be shut down, must be regulated, that they're the problem, or is there still some question as to proving that? You know, our political leaders like to regulate, and they like to regulate and say the problem is over once it's regulated. In a country like the UK, it's possible because there's a, an, a, an enforcement agency that can make sure that regulations are followed. There are for enforcement for many different sectors. In many developing countries, making a regulation without enforcement or where there's corruption and enforcement isn't done properly can be more of a risk than a benefit. And there's evidence after the SARS outbreak that when markets were shut down, live animal markets were shut down, people knew exactly where to get those live markets at other places in black market that was out of view of the, uh, the officials and out of view of regulators, and it just continued to spread as we see now. So regulation is fine. Regulation without enforcement is a risk. Okay. Um, this, so I just wanted to bring up something that came up last night. I'm, I'm not sure how um, up on it you are. The WHO um, led team that came back from China yeah. investigating how, what China's doing, what impact it's having, and uh, what the next steps are reported last night, uh, some of the highlights of their, their findings. And um, th there's been a lot of talk about uh, what's going on in China may be shambolic or too authoritarian, a lot of speculating, of, of assessing how China's been handling this. But um, the upshot of this report from the, um, uh, the visit, which I, I must say had international members, really, really impressive uh, backgrounds, um, a, an independent group. And the upshot that, that they came up with was that um, China's pretty much used a lot of classic public health interventions, old-fashioned classic interventions that a lot of people weren't sure could work on this scale. But at the same time, it was technologically powered, science-driven, and very agile response at a phenomenal scale. Um, I mean, they did the case finding and the contact tracing in a really extraordinary way with extraordinary rigor and discipline and very tailored um, incredible collective action, and they repurpose the whole government machinery to uh, make this work. Um, and the, the opinion was that after 30 years of doing this kind of work, Bruce Aylward, who led this mission, said he'd never seen anything like it, and he wasn't sure it would work, but he seems to think it is working, not it's worked because it's not finished yet, but it is working, and he concluded that they've probably averted hundreds of thousands of cases in taking this approach, and that the impact has been striking on the um, epidemic curve. And he basically said that what China demonstrates is that where this is going is within the control of our decisions to apply this kind of rigor and approach to this disease and its outbreak. And I just wondered, do you agree? And if so, do you see that that would be replicable in other places, in other contexts? Yeah, well, China has a very unusual situation in SARS and also in this outbreak. It's been an all-government approach. It's been really an all-government approach. It hasn't been um, health. It hasn't been animal health. It's been all of government. And the same that they did in SARS, they pulled out their civil um, society, their, their civil societies, their, their, their cells in, of workers in various places and others to really take this on as 
an, a mission that the Chinese people must do in order to protect each other. And this is the word that they've spread throughout China, that this is to do, to, to protect each other as well as to stop this outbreak if possible. Of course, the outbreak, the final outcome will not be, be known for quite a while. What's known is that outside of the Hubei province, they have been able to contain fully some outbreak situations, but at the same time, they're seeing cases pop up where they didn't expect them. That's what the team reported. At the same time, um, they've treated the whole epicenter of this outbreak as one cluster. So they've surrounded it with a wall of isolation and quarantine, and they've had citizens assume this as a responsible measure in their own country to help each other. Singapore has taken a very similar approach, but it's been a more open approach. And as you know, in general, Asians are very polite when they have infections and when they, when they are infected with something that they you know, are afraid they'll pass on to others. And they many times wear masks to protect themselves from coughing or sneezing on anyone. That's um, very ingrained in many Chinese and Asian cultures. And Singapore has played on that and made the citizens responsible for each other. And, and that is the current slogan in Singapore that people are responsible for each other's health. And they're working together in a similar way of, of quarantine and isolating, but in a different context. So the answer would be that is, is China doing right? China's doing what it can do best in its own context based on its risk assessment. Singapore is doing what it can do within its civil society and its context, and the UK is doing the same. So, you know, rather than try to criticize a country, um, what we need to do is build on what they're doing that's positive, as WHO attempted to do last evening. And, you know, in situations some, such as this, it's a very difficult decision to determine what's more important, individual or collective protections. And, you know, um, we all have our own opinions as to what countries are doing and who does it right and who does it wrong. But at this point in time, we hope that China has begun to decrease and maybe eliminate transmission. But if it hasn't, they've at least delayed that second wave from coming out and spreading further. Okay. Can I move on to this, this concept of global preparedness? There's been a, a lot of talk and Saying, saying that the world is ill-prepared. So after uh, H1N1 in 2009, uh, a seminal report said the world is ill-prepared for a pandemic or something of significant, you know, equal thing. Um, and a couple of years later, the same is said, and we hear this during this outbreak, that the world is ill-prepared. Is that, first of all, is that even a realistic target, the whole world prepared? It seems to be a very national, as you've just described a very tailored approach per nation, depending on their risk assessment, to say, are we ever going to get to a point where we say, OK, tick, now we're, the world is prepared. Are we ever going to get there? Is that realistic? Is that a useful framing for this? You know, we've all fallen into this, um, this way of working that says, we will do this for you. We will stop outbreaks for you. If we really want to have health protection and global health security, what we need to do is turn that around to say, we will help you strengthen your capacity so you can detect and respond and prevent outbreaks from spreading. And that's a whole change in our mentality. Right now, more funding is going into global mechanisms to help the global community respond to outbreaks in developing countries. And very little of that resource is going to developing countries and to get their governments engaged in preparing by developing the public health capacities they need to detect and respond when and where outbreaks occur. So we need to really begin to understand that it's not we who will do it for you, it's we will do it together by strengthening your capacities to do it better. Okay. Um, Dr. Ted Ross, the WHO Director General, has repeatedly said that this, this outbreak is a test of solidarity, political, financial, scientific. Um, why is that so important, and how much solidarity do you see going on in these three areas in this outbreak? 
Well, certainly technical solidarity has been quite impressive. As I said earlier, we have answers to most of the questions because people are working together. Doctors treating patients, epidemiologists fighting the outbreaks, and virologists looking at the virus, and the modelers who are helping us to better understand the dynamics of outbreaks. So we're having great support technical solidarity. Hopefully, financial solidarity will come behind that that permits not only um, countries to begin to contain outbreaks where they're occurring, the developing countries that don't have that capacity, but that also will remain available after the outbreaks are over so that countries can continue to develop their capacities. Okay. Um, I wanted to move on possibly for the, for the last question on the global health security architecture. Um, there's been a bit of criticism, as there's always criticism in these things, of WHO in not declaring this a global emergency, officially called a public health emergency of international concern, earlier. And the accusation was that this was due to politics with China. The same was leveled at WHO mm -hmm. during Ebola. This is not a new accusation. Um, this kind of maybe raises questions of how well is this system of declaring public health emergencies working? Is it really fit for purpose? Is it serving us well, this, yeah. this, this system? Well, the system was developed in a treaty context by 194 member countries of the World Health Organization. This is what they felt would be useful. There have been a couple that it would be useful to declare a public health emergency of international concern through the, the director general's consultation with an emergency committee and many other groups. The, the gift of declaring a public health emergency of international concern is to the director general alone. So member countries have asked WHO to do things this way and to declare public health emergency when it occurs. The emergency committees are always made up of experts from countries in the six different regions of WHO and it's made of people who are on rosters in those countries who have been named by their governments. Those experts, a different group, each outbreak is called together and they make a decision as to whether or not to recommend to the director general that this is a public health emergency of international concern. If they recommend that, what this means is not what most people think it means. What it means is that that committee feels that there's a threat that this outbreak will continue to spread internationally and could impact on travel and trade. So that's what the fake says, that this is an outbreak that could impact on travel and trade. And it was decided at the second committee meeting. But that alone isn't what countries always follow because that's what governments understand, that this is a public health emergency of international concern and that you should not, at this point, make recommendations of avoiding travel. That's what the regulations have said, the emergency committee said, the director general has said. But airlines, private companies make their decisions based on individual rather than collective benefits. Airlines many times decide not to fly to an area because their insurance might not cover um, people on their staff who become infected and have to return home, or because their worker rights, their workers' um, health programs don't permit them to do that. So their decisions, industry in general, are made on an entirely different set of principles than on public health principles, which are to collect, to, to protect the collective population. So there's always going to be difference, and we're always going to see those differences. And the question is, does the public health emergency of international concern really convey what it, it was meant to convey? And this, of course, has been deliberated. Uh, Brian McCloskey, who's an associate fellow here, at Chatham House has been on an expert committee along with uh, Louis Lillywhite, who's also uh, an associate fellow here. They were at WHO after the Ebola outbreak, and they've made recommendations about possible changes to the mechanism that supports the public health emergency of international concern. There will be more after this outbreak, and eventually member countries will make decisions whether or not this or something else is more appropriate. Okay, my, my last, last question before I open it up is actually on um, how WHO said that besides fighting these outbreaks, it's fighting an infodemic. The rumors, conspiracy theories, and other fake news that's uh, whipping up fear 
And rumors and misinformation have been a feature in epidemics throughout history. But um, this has been called the first true social media infodemic. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to, I mean, WHO is trying to address this. They're partnering with Twitter and Facebook. They're doing all, all sorts of things and trying to push the search terms in Google up to the top so that they come out first. But can you tell me a little bit about the impact this kind of infodemic can have on the ability to snuff out an outbreak, but also why do we repeatedly face this problem? Every time there's an epidemic, we know this. It happens, it's always happened. Is it something we just have to accept as a companion to outbreaks? And do you think it's gonna get even worse yeah. now? Well, I expect, I expect it will continue to be a problem, but uh, you know, the social media picks up messages from many different sources. And what's very important is responsible journalism that is not reporting ahead of the evidence. Because if there are responsible journalists and responsible publications that are providing the correct information, the evidence-based information, social media will pick up those messages as well as the messages that are not so um, valid and are picked up by others. And sometimes there is deliberate attempt to sabotage messages and to make people think that things are different than they are. And you know, there are many groups studying all about social media and, and finding where the rumors are and even where they originate, but there isn't yet a technology or an ability to control what's going on in the social media. But and I don't know the, the answer. But is this one of the lessons that we just haven't applied and haven't learned? Because, I mean, going back to ancient Rome, this was an issue. And why are we still grappling with this and not got on top of it? Well, I guess we have to live with it, but we have to learn how to deal with it in a better way than we are now. And I don't know what the answer is. You would know better than me, being a journalist. So let well, me turn I, the question I mean, I back it's, to you. It's not. I, I think it's interesting that you say, you know, if, if journalists are responsible, then that'll make things. But I think the the field is is a little bit, you know, the people making the inputs, so a lot wider now. It it seems like a very tough thing. I don't. I don't have the answers uh, to that either. Um, OK, so I'm going to um, open it up now to uh, the floor. So if you could please wait for the microphone, just a, a couple of more house, housekeeping. Keep your hand raised up high so that the people with the microphone can see it. And just to remind you, the questions should end with a question mark. So please don't use this as an opportunity for a speech. So uh, where are the microphones? OK. Um, can we have one there right by you? Yes, over there. Thank you. Oh, OK. Well, David wants to take two or three at a time, so why don't you have your first question? Yep. Hi, Alex, Alexandra. Can you say who you are and yep. affiliation, if you could? Hi, Alexandra. I'm a journalist at Yahoo. Um, the Sun have published a memo they've seen it put together by the National Security Communications Team. It's called COVID-19 Reasonable Worst Case Scenario. They're saying up to 80% of the population of the UK could be infected, of which 2 to 3% could be fatal. So I don't know what that's based on, probably estimations of the reproduction number, but how plausible does that seem to you, up to 80%, apparently from an official document? Thank you. Next other questions, uh, the gentleman here in the front. We'll take two to start with. John Wilson Nurse, also a journalist and a member of Chatham House. Uh, what is the cure? What is the treatment? And are any existing antibiotics effective? Thank you. You want to go ahead and any order? Oh, okay, we can take one more. Um, not, not another journalist for now. Uh, uh, just here. So and then I'll go to the back next, next time. Remember it? Yes. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Marie. I'm a consultant with Flint Global. Um, I'm a bit interested in what effect you think this virus could have on blood supply, as in, um, in terms of infected and contaminated blood. OK, let, let me start then with the question about whether or not the projection that's done by epidemiological modelers, probably the group at, uh, at Imperial, I would think, uh, or at London School, whether or not this 80% is a figure to trust. Well, certainly in preparing for an outbreak, you want to take the most dramatic figure. 
And certainly that's a dramatic figure and the country needs to get prepared to deal with an outbreak should that occur. But that's a, I'm sure that on the modeling that was the worst case scenario and that's what governments should pick up and work on. But journalists many times don't understand what those figures mean. They don't even think that there might, and I'm not talking about you in particular, I'm just saying in general, journalists look for the most high figure rather than the figure that might occur should the reproductive rate and the transmissibility be much, much less. So journalists have a real important role to play if they take this 80% figure, they should say what it is and what the context was in which it was developed. And it's purely an epidemiological model that's based on current evidence today that will change daily as more evidence comes in. Cure and treatment. Um, certainly antibiotics might be useful in people who have had a severe pneumonia and have a bacterial infection on top of that pneumonia. And many have recommended pneumococcal vaccine for the elderly as they do for influenza. So elderly might need to get a, a pneumococcal vaccine to protect them because they're at the greatest risk. So vaccines, pneumococcal vaccine and antibiotics may have a role to play. The most important from what's understood from all these clinicians working with patients now is to sustain people in life long enough for their immune system to take over and develop the antibodies which will cure the infection. That includes various types of oxygenation, uh, nasal cannula or all the way through to extracorporeal oxygenation of blood, a whole series of things that might be required. but. The fact remains that people who are elderly and who have comorbidities, as I said earlier, are the ones at greatest risk. And so nursing homes and groups where elderly people who might have comorbidities congregate must be doubly aware of the possibility that there could be serious infection. As far as drugs, antiviral drugs, on the Chinese register there are over 200 trials going on with various antiviral drugs including traditional treatments and others. And on the international record, when I last was aware of this, which was about um, four, four or five days ago, there were 72 clinical trials on record. So there are lots of clinical trials going on for uh, drugs in China. And I understand that recently you've probably heard the same thing, not verified, that there might be an oral vaccine which is being tried also in China, which would be quite a rapid development of a vaccine if indeed that's what's occurring. Finally, okay. blood well, supply. Yep, um, of course, blood supplies are always at risk. And if this does become a generalized uh, um, infection throughout the country, then there will be a need to screen blood for um, virus. The problem, though, is that we have very few diagnostic tests at our hands today. There's really no serology yet which can be used to determine whether people have had infection and recovered and no longer have the virus. The only test available is the PCR test looking for nucleic acid, which would be appropriate for screening in blood banks because it would find virus in blood, but it's very costly and, and would have to be done. Thank you. Another round of questions. Go to the back, far back corner there. Juliette Samuel, The Telegraph. Um, you just uh, mentioned cost, and I wondered how uh, you view the, the trade-off between containment um, and health outcomes and very dramatic economic impacts, which can also have knock-on effects maybe on health, uh, mass quarantines and things like that, and um, what the approach should be there. Um, in the middle, here, the lady with the white top. Hello, I'm Caroline Vood from Médecins Sans Frontières from Doctors Without Borders. My question was also uh, about the use of quarantine when that often has negative effects on outbreak control, but I'd add to that as well how uh, WHO is encouraging uh, best practices uh, from lessons learned of previous epidemics and particularly in terms of not directing all attention resources uh, towards the epidemic when they are equally needed in other health needs. Okay, one one more in the middle here, the, the guy with the gray shirt. Thanks. 
uh, James Holmes, Staffordshire University. I was just wondering, how do you think the global community can best come together to find a solution to any future global outbreak? Okay, okay. <clears throat> quarantine. Uh, well, let's talk first about cost of approaches. You know, the cost of the approach depends on the feasibility of that cost within a country. And that's how decisions are made, unfortunately or fortunately. So the decision made in Cambodia based on its risk assessment will be entirely different than the decision made in the United Kingdom. I know that in the United Kingdom, and I know in many countries, cost is a major concern for all outbreaks, including this one, and there's a constant look at that to see when the balance might shift to needing to spend more time on mitigation strategies, which improve um, hospital availabilities and get the hospitals ready rather than on um, the approaches that are currently being used. But, you know, in, hum in saving human lives and in protecting populations, it's very seldom that at the start of an outbreak people think about cost. They put in what they can, which is only normal to do, and then as they begin to understand the cost effectiveness and cost benefit of what they're doing based on their own risk assessment, they modify as necessary. So that's the best answer I can give you on that. Regarding the MSF question on quarantine and best practice, well, you know, um, epidemics don't always affect only people who are involved in the epidemic, as you know best of all. They, occur, they affect also people who are trying to get health care and can't get into the hospital or the health facility. In the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa, childhood deaths from measles and malaria were greater than the deaths from Ebola because patients couldn't get to the hospitals or vaccination service couldn't complete, com be completed. So, you know, that has to be weighed. Maintaining a health service open has to be weighed with the cost of quarantining and do other, doing other activities. And again, it's a national risk assessment uh, procedure. WHO recommends that countries do its own risk assessment, that it determine, and I believe they will say this, if they haven't, our report from the committee yesterday will say this, that they have to be looking at what's of more value at, present, at the present situation, individual or collective protection. And as they go through the outbreak, they'll make those decisions. Does that answer your question, or do you want to ask more? Well, no, what, ask more if you want to, because I'd like to answer it. It, it does answer the question, but also I think history has told us over and over again that quarantine as a control measure has usually negative knock-on effects, including distrust of government and health authorities, as well as social unrest. Uh, yet it's been used very widely here. Now, so far, it seems like that has not yet been a byproduct, but it could be on the horizon. What thoughts uh, are, or what's being discussed so far around this? Well, at WHO, just today on a discussion that I had, one of the major emphases was on helping people understand that it's their responsibility to protect each other. And if they understand that, and they, their government does decide on quarantine, then they will understand why they're being quarantined. That doesn't say the negative impacts of quarantine will not weigh on them because they will, but clearly if it's considered a social responsibility to do what your government says and if you trust your government, then you can do it. If you don't trust your government, then you have a situation such as occurred in West Africa in the Ebola outbreaks where there was no trust in what government was saying about how they could best stop the outbreaks. And, you know, there are many issues. The same is, is it right for groups like MSF to continue responding rather than to strengthen infrastructure? I know that's a common discussion with MSF, and these are all discussions that we need to bring out in the open and finally make decisions about. The third question. And the third question was on um, the global community. How does the global community... Yeah, how does the global community need to come together? Well, they've come together already in understanding about the epidemic, and they're working together um, along with um, the, the, the journals and others to get this evidence out to people. What there is in the world is a pandemic emergency fund at the World Bank, which needs to be activated, hopefully will be activated soon, which provides funding to developing countries to de if they develop a plan for how they will deal with the outbreak appropriately. And that's one source of, of funding. 
In addition, WHO and other UN agencies have gone out with a joint appeal in order to uh, make sure that funding becomes available. But even more importantly is for governments to get engaged and make their responses cross-government involving funding that goes into other parts of the government so that they can divert it as necessary to outbreak containment. So there are a whole series of things that can be done starting nationally with an all-sector response and then moving upwards to the global situation. Okay. Questions here right at the front. Thank you. <coughs> um. I'm Michael LePage, New Scientist. You were saying earlier that much of the spread which seems to be in family clusters. What can people in that situation do to avoid infecting housemates or family members? Thank you. Uh, do you want to no, three? No. Okay. Uh, in the middle there, lady with the beige uh, top behind you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Harris Gillard, and I'm a member here at Chatham House. Um, my question is somewhat similar to the one that was just asked, and essentially is the trans how is this virus transferred? I, despite my best efforts, still not have I've not had a clear on answer on that. Thank you. One more in this round. Uh, over there, I haven't been for a while. Uh, yes, uh, two rows in. Yep, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Guy Taylor, Traceda and Company. I'm interested in transparency, and I think most people in this room living in, in Britain would be interested to know. What is Public Health England telling local authorities at the moment about this and how to prepare for um, what could, could happen next? Okay, um, family clusters and protection and how is the virus transferred? Information about that is how you, and understanding of that, is how families can protect themselves. It's known how this virus transmits from person to person, close social contact. So members of the family that are dealing with patients who are touching them to care for them or doing other things should have a mask that will protect them from a direct sneeze or cough. And also the patient that's being uh, dealt with should wear a mask because that's double protection. And at the same time, gloves should be worn if possible, as long as there's understanding of how to take them off so that contamination doesn't occur, and then hand washing afterwards. So the basics of hand washing and protecting yourself from the possibility of having a sneeze is one way. It's not yet understood whether the virus passes in body excretions such as feces, but it's thought that it can. It's thought that it probably can, the SARS virus could. And therefore, protection against fecal oral contamination, against uh, touching a patient that might, who might be infected and then touching yourself anywhere where that could be transmitted is another way. So their family understanding is how families can, family clusters can protect themselves. At the same time that if people understand those things, even in the general public, they can protect themselves. And walking down the street wearing a mask is not protection against anything except preventing you from sneezing on somebody else directly. It's not you protecting you, it's protecting others. Can you talk a bit about, maybe some more detail about how far away does, do you have to be for droplet thing? Well, Is it know, airborne? The one meter, two meter when thing? When you're speaking, when I'm speaking, we're probably contaminating each other with our droplets just by speaking because they travel. But droplets travel less for far, less distance than do aerosolizations. Aerosolation is when water is fine and remains suspended. So when I'm speaking, there's some aerosolization that's covering you with aerosol, but there's also droplets that might be reaching you, and the droplets are what are important in this infection. And how far can they go? Well, I don't know, but they can certainly go probably as far as you and me. It just depends on the force of your speaking or whether you cough during your speaking or, or sneeze. So stay away. <laughs> Well, can you give me a, a number? Like I can give you a number. Keep two meters away, yeah, three? Yeah, I think two meters is reasonable, two, two to meters. three meters, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes and no. In terms of on an airplane, yeah. Book three rows in front and back. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's right. What, what's been shown from SARS, and that's the only example we have at present, is that the virus can transmit by close contact sitting near a person in the waiting room 
when you're waiting to board the airplane, and it can also transmit in your row and one row above and one row behind. And that's about the extent. So that would cover your distance of maybe two to three meters. Doesn't sound very practical to book the row behind you and the row in front of you. <laughs> you shouldn't If travel. someone's got the money, great, great. <laughs> Transparency in Public Health England, I won't answer that because it's not my role. And I was chairman of Public Health England in the past and would not want to have that conflict of interest. But I know Claire Bainton and maybe others are here uh, who could maybe speak to that. Claire, could you say a word about that? Is anyone from PHE that would be able to address that? I know that the government is working hard to be as transparent as it can. And, you know, I can't give any more information than that because it, it, it's not my role to do that. Okay, we have time for maybe one, maybe two more rounds of questions. Um, let's see, where have I not been? Oh, uh, yes, here, right in the middle at the backish. Hello, uh, I'm Xiao from China. Uh, I wish to know what's your suggestions for cooperation between China and Britain in combating this uh, coronavirus? Thank you. Any more? I have to go over there a bit. Okay, are you a journalist? Okay, no, one. Let's, red, red jacket. Okay, great, thanks. Not that I have anything, I just want a bit of balance. Thank you. Next round, definitely, you go. So, uh, uh, thank yeah. you for, for putting the obligation on us as individuals. I sort of like and don't like that. What would your advice be um, for people who have a cough, who have not been to these countries that are hot spots in, when it comes to traveling in public um, trains, etc.? And what would your advice be to us who are traveling right next to them, sandwiched in as sardines as we often are? How many is that? We've we done two. three. Oh, two, one more, one more. Okay, down here, right at the front, lady in the stripey. And then we'll have one more round after. Hi, sorry, another journalist. <laughs> uh, I'm Hannah from The Guardian. Um, I just, it's a general question, really, but I think people have a real difficulty reconciling advice that this is not necessarily much worse than a cough or a cold if you're healthy. Um, not elderly, not got any underlying conditions, but then also seeing this kind of drastic, um, these drastic measures to try and contain it and slow it down. Is there an easy way for people to kind of get their head around that? Is it because governments aren't thinking about this in the same way as an individual manages the risk and they're trying to kind of think about the impact on the whole system and how hospitals are going to deal with a massive influx? I just think it'd be really helpful to have a way of kind of helping people think about that. Okay, let me start with the last one first because I think it's, it's journalists who have a major role to play in this. And journalists need to clearly understand the issues and they need to be able to convey these to their readership. And that's, there's nothing that can replace that. Honest, evidence-based journalism. Providing the facts as they understand them or getting the facts from others if they don't understand them. So that's how public can be empowered. And I'm going to say something which isn't going to make you happy, but I'm going to say again that the public, every individual needs to know what their role is in this and that they're responsible for their own health and for the health of others in their collective. So coming back to um, the cough in the public, um, certainly we all know that you don't put your hand over your mouth today. You put your, your, your elbow up and you stop that cough from spreading. That's responsible behavior. That's behavior that will prevent any cough from spreading whether it's coronavirus or not. And how do we know if we have coronavirus? It's a good question. The only thing I can tell you is that we will all have colds over the next year and we'll all be worried do we have coronavirus or not. But good common reasoning, what's called contact tracing for yourself, to see if you were in, touch, in contact with somebody who had a cold, who wasn't, didn't have coronavirus, or if you can't find a contact, to think back to the public's places where you were, where maybe you were infected. But it's, again, our responsibility as individuals to do that contact tracing that epidemiologists do in an outbreak situation every time we develop a cold or any symptom which we think might come from others. That's the best I can do on that. And 
the, was there another? Oh, cooperation between the UK and Britain. I can't really answer that question, but I can look historically at what uh, the UK has been doing with China. And one of the major efforts of the develop, of DFID has been to work with Chinese um, epidemiologists and scientists to make sure that they gain the same international experience and understanding that has been the privilege to obtain here in the UK because of the active work that they've done in the past centuries on outbreak response and containment. So there, I know from DFID there's been an active collaboration with Chinese experts to try to strengthen their capacities, um, not their capacities as much as their understanding of how they can transfer the great skills and knowledge that they have to others. I can't talk about other co cooperation at present because I don't know. Okay, well, it's, it's one minute to two, so I guess uh, that's all the time we have for questions, but I did want to slip in one last one um, for me, which is um, Jonathan Quick in his book, 2018, it's called The End of Epidemics. Um, he said that the world reacts to infectious disease outbreaks in a cycle of panic and complacency. Um, is that something you agree with? And if you do agree, where are we in that cycle with this outbreak? Well, I think that, that what's been important to date is that there has not been a great amount of panic. In Singapore, for example, there was concern early on and store shelves became empty in some places, grocery stores became empty in some places. But now, understanding that they're, they're, what's being done is being effective, they've, the, the concerns in Singapore have calmed down. That was a major source with over 90 cases occurring. There is concern now in South Korea, in Iran, and in other places, and that concern is well-founded. But transparency can prevent panic. And, you know, the UK has not had a panic situation. The North America has not had one. Most European countries have not had one. Even Italy today is not really having a panic situation because there's transparency in what's going on. There's understanding of what's being done to attempt to stop this. And as more and more information becomes available, it begins to be more understandable that this is a disease like others which are occurring in human populations. And it, it maybe isn't as severe as originally thought, but it still is a concern because it does cause mortality. So transparency, and I, I know John O'Quick quite well, and I, I believe that in some countries panic is the concern, but not in all countries. And panic is directly related to the amount of transparency and information that governments and the journalists provide to people. And are we anywhere in the complacency end of that spectrum? Not yet. Okay, great. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you so much, David, for being with us, and thank you all.